the German Messerschmitt ME262. Sleek, fast, and heavily armed, it was a quantum leap in fighter technology. For the Allies, the appearance of the new swept-wing fighter caused a great deal of anxiety and consternation. Nothing they had could come close to its awesome performance. The top Allied fighter at the end of the war was the Spitfire Mark 14, with a top speed of 446 miles an hour. The Messerschmitt 262, which we captured and tested at Farnborough, had a top speed of 568 miles an hour. An advantage of almost 125 miles an hour, which means an aircraft with this performance, which is a quantum jump, can dictate terms of combat. It can initiate or finish combat as it wishes. It was a very formidable weapon indeed. Considered by many to be the world's first jet fighter, it was in fact a distant second. Indeed, the first air-to-air -air kill credited to a jet fighter goes to the Gloucester Meteors of 616 Squadron RAF. On August 4, 1944, Flying Officer Dixie Dean, using the wingtip of his Meteor, toppled a V-1 flying bomb, sending it crashing into the ground. While the V-1 was a pilotless aircraft, it would still go down in history as the first jet versus jet encounter. It was a telling indictment. After a 21-month lead in jet fighter development, the Germans found themselves with just one design in production, the ME-262. By June 1944, only a handful were in service. But there was another jet fighter, one designed and built before the ME-262, the Heinkel HE-280. Designed by Ernst Heinkel, it was capable of over 500 miles per hour. At this late stage of the war, the HE-280 was nowhere to be seen. First flown in September of 1940, it was two years ahead of Willy Messerschmitt's ME-262. What happened? Was it simply indifference on the Luftwaffe's part, or was the promise of the HE-280 sabotaged by political interference, incompetence, or bitter personal rivalries? To find the answers, we must first look at the state of military aircraft design and production, beginning in the 1930s. Since the end of the First World War, aircraft engine horsepower steadily increased. At the beginning of the 1930s, new engine designs and the promise of the supercharger led to more and more horsepower. The new all-metal monocoque airplane revolutionized aircraft design. The possibilities seemed limitless. Speed, altitude, and range records were smashed. Military commanders saw great promise in these new designs, and as Europe crept toward war, orders for new bombers and fighters began to rise. With little time or money left for the development of any new or questionable propulsion systems, work focused on the evolution of the piston engine. Many engine builders called the idea of a jet engine the thing. Technically unfathomable, and little more than a pipe dream. But there were those whose pipe dreams would become reality. In 1930, Flying Officer Frank Whittle, RAF, applied for a patent for his jet engine. This was followed by Hans Joachim Pabst von Ohain and his secret jet engine patent in 1935. Robert Pohl, a colleague of Ohain at the University of Göttingen, was instrumental in bringing Ohain's invention to the attention of leading German aircraft manufacturer Ernst Heinkel. This man, Pohl was his name, he wrote to Heinkel, whom he knew, and he said, you know, I have a man here who is into something which I think has a tremendous future to it. He, he is into jet propulsion. It's a continuous combustion engine. It draws air in the intake, compresses it, and then the combustion cans are sprayed with, with gasoline and it, it, it turns a turbine wheel to keep the thing running and the exhaust comes out the half end of it. As long as you give it fuel, it'll run forever. And he says, I have a man here who, who uh, wrote a thesis about this sort of, uh, of application for, for a jet engine. It, it pleased me very much if, if, you, if you would meet him and see him and talk to him about his ideas and his applications for future aircraft. 
With Heinkel's backing, the German inventor created a line of experimental centrifugal flow jet engines, similar to Whittle's, each with ever more thrust. The entire program was conducted as a private venture and in the utmost secrecy. The German air ministry was kept in the dark. On the other hand, Heinkel was also unaware that BMW was working on their own jet engine. BMW's design was an axial flow unit. More complicated than the centrifugal design, it offered more power and greater efficiencies. It was also being developed with the full knowledge of the German air ministry. In time, axial flow designs would power Germany's fledgling jet force. Early in the days before, immediately before the war, the Germans had become aware of the practicality of a jet-propelled engine as being pioneered by Frank Whittle. And at first, they followed the same concept as Whittle of centrifugal flow, which is a, the simplest form of jet engine, really, and also probably the most reliable at that stage, certainly, in the pioneering efforts. But eventually, they turned quite rapidly after their first, um, if you like, experiments onto the, ax onto the axial flow type, which really um, offers many advantages. And they concentrated thereafter totally on axial flow engines. And within the limitations of the strategic materials they had, they were very successful in this. The only problem was that the axial flow engine is complex and therefore difficult to produce, time-consuming to produce. And also, unless you have the right strategic materials to contain the heat stresses, it can have a rather short productive life. Work on a suitable test airframe for Heinkel's revolutionary new power plant was conducted at the same time. By August 1939, both engine and airframe were ready. Heinkel's HE-178 was no masterpiece. The short fuselage and stubby elliptical wooden wings did not exude a sense of speed. On August 27th, test pilot Eric Varsitz settled himself into the cramped cockpit of the tiny aircraft. Watched by Ernst Heinkel and a small group of mechanics, the HE-178 began to roll. The takeoff run was short. Climbing to 500 meters, Varsit circled the airfield once and came in for a perfect landing. Total flight time, seven minutes. History had been made. Wasting no time, Heinkel telephoned Ernst Udet, the chief of aircraft procurement and supply at the RLM, the Reich's Air Ministry. The response Heinkel received was far from enthusiastic. The world's first jet would have to wait. On September 1st, Germany plunges Europe into war. Long before 1939, the name Heinkel had become a household name in Germany. Indeed, Ernst Heinkel's Flugzeugwerk had gained a worldwide reputation despite considerable restrictions placed on German aviation by the Versailles Treaty of 1919. During the 1920s and 30s, Heinkel produced a number of new military types for countries like Sweden and Japan. With the rise of Hitler in 1933 and the expansion of the new Luftwaffe, the opportunities for Heinkel seemed endless. Orders for fighters and bombers began to pour in. While many of Heinkel's designs, like the HE-111 bomber, were very good, they lacked what he desired the most, speed. Heinkel was passionate about high-speed flight. Well, Heinkel, he loved aircraft that flew fast. He wasn't all that in, into aircraft that, that were, they were, they were fighters, propeller-driven fighters and escorts and that sort of stuff, like the Funk Wolf 190 or the, or the Messerschmitt BF-109. He was a man consumed by s speed. The faster an aircraft knew, man, I'm for that. Even before the first flight of the HE-178, he created the HE-176 the world's first rocket plane in 1939. Unfortunately for Heinkel, official reaction was muted, and with the onset of war, all work on the project ceased. Udet, Goering, 
And all those other people in the early Reich's Luftfahrt Ministerium were propeller people. They believed airplanes that they were, they were driven by propellers and alternate engine systems. They, they said, no, 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 an airplane flies best with propellers. And, and so Heinke w w was looked upon as some kind of a crackpot. And, and the re research he was doing on jet engines, they, they felt it was just silly and, and waste of money. And so he, he never got any real support from, from the Nazi government. Shortly after Hitler came to power, a new requirement for an ultra-modern single-seat monoplane fighter was issued. Heinkel's response was the HE-112, powered by a 695-horsepower Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine. Its direct competition was the Messerschmitt Bf 109 V1, also powered by the same Kestrel engine. The results were very close. While the Bf 109 was slightly faster, the HE-112 had a tighter turning circle and superior field performance. Amid general surprise and many raised eyebrows, Messerschmitt was awarded the new contract. The Heinkel 112 was the better airplane as a combat airplane, and Rech Lin test pilots endorsed that view entirely. So there was no doubt that from the pilot's point of view, Heinkel's 112 was number one. For Heinkel, it was a bitter disappointment. It also marked the beginning of a new and rocky relationship between the aircraft manufacturer and the German air ministry. Undeterred, Heinkel continued with his quest for speed. Despite the lack of enthusiasm from Ernst Dudet and later Erhard Milch, the state secretary, Reich Air Ministry, Heinkel pressed on with his privately funded HE-280 twin-jet fighter. At the same time, the Messerschmitt Design Bureau completed a new twin-jet design study for the German Air Ministry. Submitted on June 7, 1939, the new proposal was accepted. On March 1, 1940, a contract for three airframes was awarded with the official designation ME-262. Simultaneously, and in the face of official apathy, Heinkel was rewarded with a similar contract. Even before the official contract had been signed, Heinkel had in fact cut metal on the first HE-280 prototype. The HE-280 was a quantum leap in aircraft design. Aside from the jet propulsion, the HE-280 was equipped with the world's first ejection seat and a tricycle landing gear. Prior to its first flight, a series of aerodynamic tests were conducted. Fitted with dummy engine nacelles, the prototype was towed into the air by an HE-111 and subjected to a number of gliding test runs. By March 30, 1941, the HE-280 V1 was ready for its first flight. With just enough fuel for takeoff, the HE-280 lifted into the air. After a single low-altitude, low-speed circuit, the HE-280 made a safe landing. It was the world's first jet fighter, but the world didn't take notice. The Heinkel 280 was a, a, a state-of-the-art machine which no one really appreciated. Just as the Germans were developing their jet technology, the Allies had their own secret jet programs as well. In England, Frank Whittle, like Ernst Heinkel, was battling against the same government indifference. The new jets were not a high priority. Frank's persistence, however, finally paid off. On February 3rd, 1940, the British Air Ministry issued Britain's first jet aircraft contract. Gloucester's aircraft was selected to meet specification E-2839. Design of this new aircraft was a collaboration between Frank Whittle and Gloucester Aircraft. The new E-2839 was a low-winged monoplane with the engine mounted behind the cockpit and equipped with a tricycle undercarriage, just like the HE-280. Air for the engine was drawn in from the nose and passed through ducts on each side of the cockpit. Like the Heinkel HE-178, the Gloucester E-2839 was one of the world's first technology demonstrator aircraft. Its sole purpose was to flight test Whittle's W-1 centrifugal jet engine, which developed a modest 860 pounds of thrust. A remarkable aircraft by any standard, two examples were built. On May 15, 1941, the first E-2839 took off from Cranwell Airfield at 7.45 p.m. 
The flight lasted just 17 minutes. The promise of Whittle's engine pushed the Air Ministry towards an operational jet fighter. Even before the first D-2839 took shape, specification F-940 for a new jet fighter was finalized in December 1940. Because the new jet engine didn't have the required thrust, the new fighter would have to be a twin-engine design. The F-940 was not a radical or advanced aerodynamic design. Following accepted aircraft practices, it was fairly conventional. On February 7, 1941, Gloucesters received an order for 12 Gloucester Whittle airplanes to the F-940 specification. These would become the first Gloucester Meteors. Back in Germany, parallel work on the ME-262 was not proceeding smoothly. When the contract for the prototype had been issued, it was obvious to Messerschmitt that BMW had been unduly optimistic. The new BMW 003 axial flow engine was still unreliable, without sufficient power. It also had a substantially larger diameter. In order to accommodate the new larger engine, Messerschmitt had to completely redesign his original airframe. The new aircraft would be larger, with the engines housed in under-wing nacelles, just like the HE-280. While BMW struggled with their jet engine, the Junkers Aircraft Company was working on their own turbojet, the Jumo 004. This would provide a backup in case the BMW 003 failed. On November 1940, the Jumo 004 was bench tested for the first time. Major problems were revealed, and just as the HE 280 V1 made its first flight, Messerschmitt's first ME 262 V1 was fitted with a nose mounted Junkers Jumo piston engine. It was not the start Willie Messerschmitt was hoping for. On April 5, 1941, the HE-280 was officially unveiled. To impress his guests, Heinkel arranged for a demonstration between a Focke-Wulf FW-190A and the HE-280. During the mock combat, the HE-280 completed four tight circles before the FW-190 completed three. Finally, Ernst Dudet showed some enthusiasm. Top speed was 485 miles per hour, 77 more than the FW-190. Impressed, the German Air Ministry sanctioned the manufacture of 13 HE-280A pre-production aircraft. Unfortunately for Heinkel, mass production of the HE-280 was still out of reach. Heinkel now found himself up against personal rivalries, duplication, and incompetent leadership. To understand this state of affairs, we have to return to the beginning of the new Luftwaffe. After Hitler took power, he appointed Hermann Göring as leader of the new Luftwaffe. A World War I ace and squadron commander, Göring soon gave a number of his ex-squadron mates titles in the newly formed Luftwaffe. Ernst Dudet was one of the first. Many had no experience in aircraft production or had any business background. By 1941, German aircraft manufacturing was in a crisis. Under the command of Ernst Dudet, aircraft production had stalled. For the first year and a half of war, Germany was only producing 800 aircraft a month. It wasn't until after the Battle of Britain and the setbacks in Russia did the German high command take action. Unfortunately for Udet, he was unable to effect any real change. In November 1941, he committed suicide. Udet's successor was Erhard Milch. Milch was an able, ruthless administrator, but he lacked the military expertise necessary for the job. Although he had good understanding of aircraft production, he was unimaginative and a conservative when it came to research and development. July 18, 1942. The first ME-262 is ready for its first flight. Unlike the HE-280, the ME-262 is a tail dragger. Because of the nose's high angle, most of the jet's thrust is wasted. After a problematic takeoff run, it takes to the air for a short 17-minute flight. In the mesh, the 262 was first tested, it was a tail dragger. It had a tail wheel. And the only way you could get the thing up and level 
but it was for the pilot to put on the brakes and so the aircraft would come up level and then they could take off with it. Across the Atlantic, America finally enters the jet age with the first flight of the Bell P-59A. The date is October 1st, 1942. By the summer of 1942, the HE-280 was still very much in the picture. In June, the HE-280 V2 prototype was re-engined with two Jumo 004A engines, each rated at 1,852 pounds of thrust. Now, for the first time, both the HE-280 and the ME-262 are equipped with the same type of engine. Flight trials proved promising, with a top speed of 491 miles an hour being reached. A true comparison of the two fighters could now be made. Flight testing of the fourth ME-262 prototype showed that with the same power plants, it enjoyed a marked performance advantage over the HE-280. Compared to the straight-wing HE-280, the ME-262 looked faster. Its shark-like appearance and swept-back wings gave it a menacing presence. Even with this apparent advantage, the ME-262 still had a long way to go. For Heinkel and Messerschmitt, the road ahead was not a simple one. Both had suffered serious setbacks, their reputations now in question. In Messerschmitt's case, his new ME-210 twin-engine fighter was a complete failure. For Heinkel, the intractable problems associated with the disastrous HE-177 heavy bomber was a major distraction. By the summer of 1942, Germany was still victorious. After some unexpected setbacks in Russia, they were once again on the offensive. In North Africa, the first battle of El Alamein began with Erwin Rommel leading the way. From a military perspective, Germany was at the height of its power, but it was now fighting on three fronts. Losses would be heavy. In September, the Battle of Stalingrad began with much promise. It was a bloody battle of attrition, and one in which Germans were losing. On November 1st, Allied troops break out of El Alamein. Seven days later, Operation Torch begins. Allied troops invade North Africa, with American and British troops landing in Morocco and Algeria. Rommel's fabled Africa Corps is now being squeezed on two sides. November 19th, Soviet forces launch Operation Uranus. Its aim, surround the city of Stalingrad and annihilate all German forces. The Soviet offensive is a spectacular success, and by the end of January 1943, the battle is all but over. The German 6th Army surrenders. It was the first Nazi acknowledgement of failure. In May, the battle for Tunisia is over. German and Italian forces surrender, with 250,000 troops taken prisoner. These military losses represented a key turning point. Germany was now on the defensive. For the Luftwaffe, January 1st, 1943 represented a time of crisis. Its operational strength had sunk to some 4,000 aircraft. It had also failed to introduce new more modern types, aircraft like the HE-280 and the ME-262. In fact, the Luftwaffe was drawing on its last accumulated reserves. Contingency plans were non-existent. Any new military setback would be catastrophic. The German High Command had resolutely declined the possibility of waging a defensive war. From Hitler on down, the mantra had always been, attack. The losses in Stalingrad and North Africa put a severe strain on Luftwaffe resources. For the first time, serious cracks began to show. But it wasn't just the losses in North Africa and Stalingrad that hobbled the once mighty Luftwaffe. The pre-war belief that Germany's military conquests would be short led to short-term planning. New modern aircraft wouldn't be needed. It was a strategic miscalculation and one that had a direct effect on the development of Heinkel's HE-280 and Messerschmitt's ME-262. Heinkel was up against the German Air Ministry, even though he had Ernest Dudet as his very good friend and confidant. The German Air Ministry, they wanted a, a flying machine propeller driven like, like the Focke-Wolf 190, like the Messerschmitt BF-109, that 
were designed for ground support, like in Poland and elsewhere. For Heinkel, the battle for the HE-280 continued. As Germany's fortunes began to change, many still clung to the belief in a rapid victory, even in the second half of 1942. Erhard Milch was one of them. After Rudet's suicide, he did manage to increase aircraft production, but at a cost. To avoid Hitler's wrath, Milch was unwilling to add any new types to the assembly lines. Doing so would cause monthly production numbers to fall. As a result, most of the pre-war designs remained in production right until the end of the war. Unfortunately for Heinkel and Messerschmitt, Milch's aversion to risk continued to have its effect in the one field where Germany could establish technical superiority, jet planes. In September 1942, both Erhard Milch and the German Air Ministry agreed. Any preparations for series production of the ME-262 would be premature, and in view of Heinkel's numerous commitments, production of the HE-280 was unrealistic as well. It was a curious point of view, but in early 1943, that all changed. In January 1943, Heinkel's HE-280 V6 prototype, powered by two Jumo 004 engines, took flight. For the first time, Heinkel pitched this version as a fighter bomber. In a complete about-face, the German Air Ministry changed its mind and began negotiations for the manufacture of 300 280s. It now seemed as if the 280 would finally see mass production and enter service before the ME-262. Ironically, the 262 V4 prototype, powered by the same Jumo 004 engines as Heinkel's new jet bomber, enjoyed a marked performance advantage over its rival. While the HE-280 was thought to be faster with a better rate of climb and ceiling, it only had two-thirds the range. In the end, the 262 was the superior fighter. In a letter dated March 27, 1943, Milch wrote to Heinkel, ending the 280 project. In Milch's letter, he claimed that the overall war situation today no longer allows us to run two designs side by side. For Heinkel, it was a bitter defeat. In a conference shortly after, Heinkel observed that Milch and his colleagues had a noticeable sense of unease about the jet, and the talk was always about jet bombers. For Willy Messerschmitt, victory over Heinkel would prove a Pyrrhic victory. Meanwhile in Britain, the Gloucester Meteor prototype DG-206 made its first flight. Like the Germans, British officialdom and industry were slow to deliver a reliable jet engine. Official confidence was shaken when the impellers on Whittle's W-2B engine continually burst at high speed. This was eventually remedied with imported impellers from General Electric, who in 1941 built their own jet engines based on Whittle's design. Fortunately for the program, Rolls-Royce was called upon to take over development and production of the W-2B engine. Back in Germany, development of the ME-262 continued. Compared to the British, the German program was disorganized, inefficient and veiled in secrecy even from those who should have known. Surprisingly, Adolf Galland, general of the Luftwaffe fighter arm, was kept in the dark. Not until May 22, 1943, did he fly the 4262 prototype. Galland was so impressed that he recommended production of the BF-109 be halted and changed to the new jet fighter. Galland's enthusiasm swept away any remaining hesitancy and vacillation. 72 hours later, Erhard Milch ordered the 262 into series production. But many questions remained. Why did those involved in the program not see the value of the 262 sooner and act before Galland's endorsement? Why was it kept secret from Galland? And why didn't he fly the HE-280? One can only speculate as to what might have been if just two years earlier he had flown the 280. Finally, Messerschmitt had what he wanted, but there was one man who didn't agree. Adolf Hitler rejected out of hand any mass production of the ME-262. Said Hitler, nothing will be done with a new jet until I have decided on its merits. Unfortunately for Messerschmitt, 
the Fuhrer was increasingly obsessed with revenge and retribution. Striking back at the enemy was far more important than providing his fighter arm with a fighter capable of defending the Reich. This would lead directly to Germany's third jet-powered aircraft, the V-1 flying bomb. Powered by a pulse jet engine, the V-1 was the world's first cruise missile and the first jet-powered aircraft to see combat in World War II. Shortly after D-Day, the V-1 bombardment of London began. To help counter the threat, the RAF deployed the first jet fighter, the Meteor Mark I. Compared to the HE-280 and the ME-262, the Meteor was slower. But more importantly, it was a combat-ready machine powered by centrifugal jet engines. Though the German axial flow engine offered more punch, Frank Whittle, the genius behind Britain's early jet engines, was sold on the reliability of centrifugal design. Now, axial flow engines are much more complex than centrifugal, but much more efficient. Ideally, one should have headed for axial flow. But one has to put oneself back a bit in time and remember where we stood in the history of jet development, and that was not very far along the road. Whittle, quite rightly, when I talked to him, he knew all about axial flow, but I said to him, why have you gone this way, Frank, in centrifugal? And he said, because in this present state of the art, I am looking for reliability and simplicity. In November 1943, Hitler saw the ME-262 for the first time. Hitler scolded those in attendance, asking why, after years of demanding a fast bomber, was he presented with a fighter? Hitler wanted to know if the jet aircraft could carry bombs. Messerschmitt answered in the affirmative. For Hitler, the matter was settled. The ME-262 would be produced as a blitz bomber. In fact, Messerschmitt disobeyed Hitler and continued to develop his jet solely as a fighter. Six months later, when Hitler found out, he flew into an incandescent rage. On May 25, 1944, he ordered all 262s to be built as bombers. It was a major blow and added more technical problems to an already troubled program. One of the biggest and ongoing hurdles was the development of the Jumo 004 engine into a reliable power plant. The Jumo 004 was an axial flow compressor design. In theory, it offered more power over the higher drag centrifugal compressor engines used by the British. In practice, however, the Jumo engines were considerably inferior. The shortage of strategic materials like chrome and nickel led to the failure of many substandard turbine blades at high temperatures. The Jumo 004 also suffered from decreased thrust at high altitude, fuel flow problems, and flameouts if the throttle was opened or closed too quickly. The Jumo 004 was a technical and operational failure. Not only did the Jumo 004 have a very short lifespan, it was unreliable, prone to surges, stalls, and fires. This was the ME-262's Achilles heel, one Allied pilots would feast on. The engines were very sensitive. They were slow to accelerate to throttle movement, and you had to handle them very carefully to avoid flaming them out. Secondly, the designers hadn't thought of how to slow down these incredibly fast airplanes, and no air brakes were fitted. And this made life very difficult, for example, for landing. Um, you need some drag if you're going to land, and um, since there was very little drag associated with the 262, you had to do a long, slow approach to landing. And this was a, a, an Achilles heel, because the 8th USAF Mustangs realized this, and the 262s they picked off was usually in that phase of the operation. By July 1944, the Luftwaffe's fighter arm was fighting a losing battle. Unable to cope with the swarms of long-range American P-47s and P-51 Mustangs, it was quickly being destroyed. While the ME-262 was in production, the numbers in operational service were meager at best, and would remain so until the end of the war. 
the first American B-17 shot down didn't occur until August 15th. For the Germans, the situation was desperate. Shut out since the rejection of the HE-280, Ernst Heinkel was finally brought back into the jet fold. Concerned with the slow production of the ME-262, the German high command wanted a so-called rush job, a single-engine jet fighter that required little strategic materials to build. For Heinkel, it was a question of pride. Eager to prove himself once more, he accepted the challenge. Heinkel quickly realized that in order for the jet to work, the engine had to be mounted just above the fuselage, similar to the V-1. Twelve days after the specification had been issued, the HE-162 mock-up was ready. On September 23, 1944, Heinkel's HE-162 was selected for mass production. Captain Eric Brown recalls demonstrating the HE-162 to Heinkel in a post-war test flight. He was like a schoolboy jumping up and down with delight and asked very piercing questions about the handling of the aircraft. He had heard about the disaster we'd had with it. I found him with a very acute mind and struck me as a highly intelligent person. By late 1944, the German high command was fueled by fear, fantasy, and pathological denial. Galland said that the HE-162 was unrealistic. To mass produce such a crude and untried aircraft and expect it to be flown by inexperienced Hitler youth was beyond reality. Even at this late stage of the war, Heinkel was working on at least 26 different versions. Using slave labor, 100 aircraft were produced in February of 1945. On February 6th, the first group converted to the new type. In the final weeks of the war, the so-called People's Fighter saw little action. Combat claims were made but never confirmed. Only one HE-162 was ever shot down by an Allied fighter. On May 5th, Germany surrendered. It was a crushing defeat. The new jet and rocket fighters introduced late in the war had no impact on the outcome. Many have argued that if the HE-280 had been produced sooner, history would have been different. Perhaps, but in the final analysis, the 280 wouldn't have made a dramatic difference. For Ernst Heinkel, there was a deep bitterness. His early groundbreaking developments were essentially ignored. As to who actually killed the world's first jet fighter, the answer is many. The HE-280 was quite simply a victim of mismanagement and industrial chaos. After 1936, Nazi management of the aviation industry was not centralized. Udet's technical office, Goring, the general staff, Milch, and all the aircraft designers jockeyed with one another for control of the aviation program. Instead of a uniform, consistent policy towards aircraft production, confusion and chaos reigned. Goering must um, hugely accept blame for a lot of the failings of the Luftwaffe, particularly the delay and the mismanaging getting aircraft into production, and to a large extent, Udet was one of his causes of his problem. Udet was a, an extroverted, magnificent exhibition pilot in civil life, and he had been in Goering's squadron in World War I. Ernst Udet had no interest in politics, and Goering approached him as an old squadron mate and said, you know, the Nazi party needs you and your experience. Come in and be the head of our technical department. Udet was talked into this and was completely out of his depth. Firms like Heinkel and Messerschmitt tried to build everything from trainers to strategic bombers. Every effort made by the Air Ministry to move them towards any specialization was effectively countered. Clear-cut technical objectives were never issued. Programs were allowed to continue regardless of the enormous waste in time, skill and materials. Overall, the Nazi management of the aircraft industry was uncoordinated, inefficient, plagued by ignorance and incompetence. Even if the HE-280 had become operational in 1942, its overall effectiveness would have been limited. It all came down to the Jumo 004 power plant. 
unreliable with a critically short lifespan, it was not ready for combat operations. Serviceability rates would have been low, as was the case with the ME-262. Finding good pilots would have been another issue. The number of newly trained pilots could barely keep pace with attrition. Fuel shortages also began to take hold. By 1943, the Luftwaffe was a dying force with no chance of recovery. As the world's first jet fighter, Heinkel's HE-280 was a marvel of technology and inspiration. Unfortunately for Heinkel, those in power saw little use for his twin jet fighter. Hitler's reluctance to produce jets almost certainly doomed what little hope Germany had of ever producing an effective jet fighter force. As the Allies sifted through the spoils of their victory, the incredible technology left behind, they counted themselves lucky that Germany had recognized the potential of jet power too late. The jets were left absolutely untouched. Now, I was puzzled about this, frankly. What had motivated this? It certainly wasn't because it was overrun too quickly for them to have got rid of these jet aircraft. I think, deep down, it was a sense of pride of what they had achieved in the technical field, and they wanted us to see it. For decades, numerous historians have studied the Luftwaffe and its failures during the Second World War. What caused an air force that was in many ways vastly superior to the Allies to come crashing down? Is there a distinct turning point that made Germany's aerial arsenal impotent against the combined strength of Britain, America and the Soviet Union? For the first time ever, put yourself right in the middle of the debate as we try to solve the greatest arguments in the history of aviation. What caused the Luftwaffe to fail? In 1933, Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany and later the Führer, enacting complete control over the fatherland. Eager to reclaim the lost territories taken from Germany after the Treaty of Versailles, the Nazi war machine realizes early on that the formation of a strong air force is vital. In 1935, it becomes official on paper and the Luftwaffe is born. The man put in charge of this department is Hermann Goering, a prominent ace from the Great War. Goering was a World War I fighter pilot. He was not interested in technology. He said something at one point, he said, well, this device is a box with coils, and I don't like boxes with coils. He still had this sort of, well, if you're courageous and brave, you don't have to worry about technological gizmos. In building this new air force, the Nazis possess many advantages that other nations do not, including a first-class aircraft industry, symbolized by the names Messerschmitt, Dornier, Heinkel, Junkers, and Fokker-Wolf. Brilliant engineers capable of taking aerodynamics to a whole new level, and a highly educated population that can build aircraft on a mass scale. By 1938, production rises to over 5,000 planes. One year later, that figure soars to over 8,000, a testament to the importance Nazis place on the doctrine of air power. What the Germans were trying to do was to employ new machines, new technologies, but to employ them in the service of a very, very old way of war that had served them well in previous conflicts and they felt would continue to serve them well in the future. Uh, I think this sets the Germans somewhat apart from neighboring countries in the 1920s and 1930s in that they are not truly looking ahead as much as they are looking back to their old traditions and grafting new technologies onto them. Before war is declared in August of 1939, Germans' aerial arsenal is impressive to say the least. Ready to go is the ME-109, a superior single-engine fighter, the Junkers 87 Stuka, a terrifying dive bomber, the Heinkel 111 and the Dornier 17 flying pencil, two top-of-the-line medium-range bombers. 
This, in addition to the largest air transport industry in the entire world, exemplified by the Junkers 52, a workhorse that will be at the centerpiece of the German offensive. Even with all these phenomenal aircraft, a key ingredient is missing, as is often noted by Second World War historians, the absence of strategic bombers. This void does not go unnoticed in 1935, when General Walter Weber, realizing their importance, enthusiastically supports the building of long-range aircraft to battle any potential enemy, most likely the Soviet Union. General Walter Weber was promoting what he called the Urals Bomber. He believed that the industrialization, tanks, planes, etc., that was going on in the Urals area had to be demolished if you were going to win a war against Russia. Weber writes, Air power carries the war right into the heart of enemy country from the moment war breaks out. It strikes at the very root of the enemy's fighting power and of the people's will to resist. You know, Walter Weber was very much in favour of, of, of this uh, long-distance bomber to try and bomb Russia. And it, that actual project was given the, uh, the name of the Euro bomber. Weber actually then uh, put specifications out to both Dornia and Jungers for the building of this long-range bomber. Out of this came the Dornier 19 and the Junkers 89. But neither of these aircraft had the performance that was currently available in the United States of the B-17 Flying Fortress. So therefore, neither of those airplanes really progressed very far beyond a couple of prototypes. Dying due to a plane crash in 1936, his doctrine epitomized by the Dornier 19 and the Junkers 89 are scrapped by Goering. Goering, I think, didn't go along with this because he rather took the view that, that Hitler had that um, they could win by blitzkrieg and um, they wouldn't be required to get into this lengthy process of using heavy bombers. Inquiring as to how many twin-engine planes can be made for every four-engine one, the answer given to him is two and a half. The field marshal response is that the Führer does not ask me how big my bombers are, but how many there are. It is important to note that the decision not to build long-range bombers cannot be considered a failure. For Germany, the raw materials needed to build such planes would require large amounts of rubber, metals and fuel, all of which would have to be imported for a hefty price. Of the 4,500 tons of aluminium needed per month for aircraft production, only half is available during the Wefer era. The air force that he and others envisioned was simply uneconomic at the time. What truly represented the German way of war is instead a tactical air force. The German war of movement attempted to defeat as much of the enemy army as possible within the opening weeks of fighting. Uh, so the tactical level of, of fighting for an individual position and then the operational level of attempting to defeat an enemy army. But arguably, Germany had never been very good, and this would go back to Prussia before it, at the kind of long-term strategic planning that the Allies were so skilled at in World War II. Arguably, this was because the Germans felt they had to win all their wars quickly or they would not win them at all, and that attempting to play strategic warfare with the vast economic and industrial resources of the United States was a losing game from the start. Working closely with those on the ground, the Luftwaffe is wildly successful as the Second World War begins. Poland is easily demolished. Norway is taken away from the British effortlessly. The Low Countries and even the power of France cannot resist German might during the year 1940. It appears that nothing can stop Nazi forces from gobbling up the continent of Europe. Certainly, certainly the Luftwaffe played an extremely important part in the opening German victories of World War II. And when we say opening victories, we don't mean the first six months, we mean the first two years in, in which it looked like a German victory is very much in the offing. The German Air Force was very skilled at the tactical level, that is cooperation with the ground forces. It was extremely successful at the operational level of war, the intermediate level, that is carrying out campaigns against, uh, against enemy supply lines, for example, feeding troops and men to the front. With the fall of France, Britain is the only nation standing in the way of this German juggernaut. 
In order to finish off the rebellious island nation, a plan known as Operation Sea Lion is approved. It calls for the Luftwaffe to achieve air superiority over the English Channel. Once this is completed, German forces will be deployed onto British soil. However, during this pivotal battle, the Luftwaffe is dealt its very first aerial defeat. Primarily through the use of Spitfires and Hurricanes, the English are able to push back German planes from the coast of Britannia. While this monumental struggle ensues, we discover one of the Luftwaffe's greatest failure, its lack of coordination with the Kriegsmarine. Goering uh, said, everything that flies is mine, and bitterly fought against any attempts by the German Navy to get a hold of a piece of the air action. When they wanted long-range aircraft uh, assigned to them, Goering, uh, actually, Dernitz went behind Goering's back directly to Hitler, and I think got a dozen of the Focke-Wulf Condors uh, assigned to him. Uh, Goering, when he found out about this, was furious and actually cut off all cooperation with the Kriegsmarine at this point. Despite pleas by Admiral Rader to create a separate air force for the Navy, Goering refuses to give the green light to any potential inter-service rival. The roots for this conflict come from each service's desire to be recognized as the one who brought victory to the fatherland. Of course, there has always been the, the, the rivalry between the Navy and the Air Force uh, from the point of view that we refer to ourselves as the Imperial Navy and refer to the Air Force as the Nazi Air Force. So that differentiated us already in attitude and character. In hindsight, Goering's decision proves fatal as Germany and Britain battle it out in both the skies and on the high seas. Winston Churchill would write that the greatest threat to Britain was the Battle of the Atlantic, where German U-boat submarines are enormously successful in sinking English shipping. I think Churchill was quite correct that the Battle of the Atlantic was the one front where Britain could really lose the war because they were so dependent on supplies, even food, coming from North America that if that lifeline was cut, uh, Britain would have been really in, in dire straits. With the defeat of France, bases are built right on their coast, giving these vessels an even bigger theater to disrupt the lifeline of Britain. Had aerial forces worked closely with these U-boats, or if a separate naval aviation wing was created, it would be a game-changer in Germany's war against Britain. Proof of this can be seen in the Focke-Wulf 200 Condor, an aircraft that despite its limitations is excellent in attacking English ships. With no more than a dozen planes, they successfully sink 85 merchant vessels and over 300,000 tons of shipping. When the Germans started to deploy a fairly small number of the Focke-Wulf 200 Condors to attack Allied shipping, they were able to have really a devastating effect. Also, had the new invention of a magnetic mine been dropped by Luftwaffe planes into the English Channel, its enemy could have been starved out of the war. This marks the first major failure of the Luftwaffe. It was our common complaint um, um, of us, the little people, let's say, that uh, there was no coordination whatsoever between the German Navy and the German Air Force. With a stalemate on the Western Front, Germany decides to keep the British at bay and instead focus attention on their ally, the Soviet Union. Enacting a war plan known as Operation Barbarossa, some three million Nazi soldiers equipped with rifles, tanks and planes begin the biggest land assault in history. Using less than 3,000 aircraft, a force smaller than that utilized in the battle against France, Germany is miraculously able to push back Soviet forces to the suburbs of Moscow. The decision to launch Operation Barbarossa exposes the Luftwaffe to its second major failure the lack of maintenance and repair on the ground. When a German aircraft is damaged, it is sent back to the fatherland for repair. When fighting a relatively short and tactical war against France, this particular system works fairly well. 
When fighting a long drawn out war of attrition against the communists, however, it proves to be a gigantic blunder. In the Soviet Union, with the fighting taking place far away from the major cities of Germany, the time it takes engineers to repair a damaged aircraft and have it sent back to the front is enormous. And by 1941, less than 30% of the Luftwaffe's airfields are operational, a fact that is almost inconceivable when taken into account that Germany is fighting a two-front struggle. As Field Marshal Erhard Milch would reflect after the war, the vertical organization in four territorial determined Luftflotte commands was grossly inadequate for launching a war well beyond the borders of the Third Reich. The attack of June 22, 1941 would in retrospect be a catastrophic mistake. For those like Goering, men who had never fought on the Eastern Front during the First World War, they would grossly underestimate the Soviet will and the industrial capacity of a regime thought to be so backwards by Hitler. Moving its factories far beyond the Ural Mountains, they are out of range of German bombers. The ghost of General Wefer comes back to haunt the Luftwaffe. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Germany declares war against the United States. Before this decision is made, Hitler shrugs off any suggestion of a possible American threat in the form of an arsenal of democracy. In declaring war, Hitler foolishly adds yet another enemy to the Third Reich's list, one with a production capacity that is unparalleled. With two oceans separating America from the fighting, its people can go on producing without the threat of bombardment. Britain would have hauled the flag down long ago if it had not been for America's support, one field marshal said. With Germany by this time experiencing severe shortage of aluminium and copper, America is fully stocked of these and other vital raw materials. By 1944, the United States is able to churn out over 96,000 planes per year, one every five minutes, more than double that of the Germans. Before this catastrophic decision is made, it is important to note that by 1940, even Britain, with its shipping being torpedoed at an unprecedented rate, is outproducing Germany in aircraft. The British are able to improvise, and as a result produce outstanding planes like the de Havilland Mosquito, an aircraft made from plywood. In contrast, by 1941, with Nazi forces engaged in a two-front war, total production is just over 11,000 planes a yearly increase of only 3,000 from when the war began. It is clear that the Third Reich's total output is only a fraction of what it could be. One of the failures of the German Luftwaffe was their inability ever to work out a sane procurement and production process. Prototypes would be built and abandoned. They would be rebuilt and altered by Hitler's order and abandoned, and rebuilt a third time and perhaps put into production as an aircraft very, very different from what the original designers had intended. This lack of planning and foresight can be attributed to the man who took control of Luftwaffe production in 1936, long before the war began. His name is Ernst Udet. An outstanding ace from the First World War, he is put in control by Goering, replacing Wilhelm Wimmer. His appointment to this powerful position marks the third, and possibly the greatest failure, of the Luftwaffe. Goering placed one of his World War I fighter ace buddies, Ernst Udet, in charge of technical developments. Udet really didn't know anything about this stuff. Udet's forerunner, Wimmer, has been outstanding in overseeing the Luftwaffe's second generation aircraft during the pre-war era, including the ME-109, the Junkers 87, and the Heinkel 111. With Udet as his replacement, however, the next line of aircraft is a far cry from their predecessors. One of his hobby horses was dive bombers. He had seen, actually, in America, interestingly, between the wars, a demonstration of dive bombing, thought every German bomber should be made into a dive bomber, and then even ordered this new four-engine bomber, Heinkel 177, under development, to be made into a dive bomber. Well, Heinkel himself who was, after all, an engineer who understood this, kept trying to talk him out of it, said this is ridiculous, but was overruled. And so they had to go back and strengthen the wings of the, uh, uh, of the 177 uh, to try to reduce drag so it could actually dive uh, at high speeds. 
they tried mounting the engines in pairs uh, instead of having four engines like you would normally think you would do on a bomber. They were mounted front and back in a single pod on each wing. This resulted in so much heat being uh, generated that the engines were constantly overheating. So it, it really, I mean, it was a crazy idea and it led directly to uh, delays and I, I guess you can really say the ultimate failure of Germany to field an effective four-engine bomber during the war. The Heinkel 177, with its odd tandem engine arrangement and an insane requirement by Udet to dive bomb, makes this plane a complete disaster from start to finish. The aircraft becomes known as the dead racehorse, with only a handful ever getting the chance to fly. The Heinkel 177 and the ME 210 go hand in hand as one of the Luftwaffe's major disasters. The Messerschmitt 210, a replacement for the ME 110, is full of problems that are never ratified. When he came up with his Messerschmitt 210, the RLF said, oh yes, that's very good, let's immediately, uh, we'll order 10,000, or whatever it was. But they went into mass production and the thing had hardly flown. It was a complete and utter disaster for Messerschmitt, which he'd never lived down, and they had to convert a lot of the built ME210s into ME410s by taking the things the aeroplanes to pieces again and reassembling them with new parts to turn it into a flyable and operational machine. As one aircraft representative is overheard saying, everything turns to dust in Udet's hands. Only one aircraft, the Fokker Wolf 190, is considered a success under his watch. A reluctance to make the hard decisions also proves costly as resources are diverted to projects that are simply unfeasible during wartime. By 1941, the need is for long-range strategic bombers, with America producing the B-17 Flying Fortress and the British reworking the Avro Manchester into the four-engine Avro Lancaster. Germany, in contrast, falls dramatically behind the Allies in producing four-engine bombers. Udet, with all his failures, commits suicide in 1941, leaving the Luftwaffe in shambles. With a Soviet victory at Stalingrad, German forces are pushed back, marking the beginning of the end. And as American and British bombers begin destroying German factories and city centers from the sky, the philosophy that General Weber endorsed years ago is coming true. Strategic bombing is proving vital in weakening the German war machine. Under the command of Field Marshal Erhard Milch, production is able to climb to 25,000 planes a year, a respectable increase, but nothing compared to what the Allies are able to produce. U.S. procurement policies, which become a giant bureaucracy, embodied in the War Department and soon thereafter World War II embodied in the Pentagon, uh, the Germans were simply not able to compete on that level. In 1944, Germany is being outmaneuvered in the realm of aircraft by the rate of over four to one. At this point, there is simply no way to compete with the United States or the Soviet Union. While much is written by historians about Allied coordination in resources and materials, little can be found about Germany's willingness to use its own allies' means of production to their advantage. This is yet another failure of the German Luftwaffe. Without a common goal and being on different sides of the world, the Empire of Japan cannot be considered Germany's biggest ally. Its most powerful friend during the war is instead the Italians. Unfortunately, with their own air force in shambles, the Nazis are reluctant to give them the licenses and the engines to build German planes on Italian soil. This proves to be a pivotal mistake, as Italy could have tripled aircraft production with German assistance, producing possibly 30,000 planes during the war. Also, Italian factories would have been out of bombing range for the Allies during the year 1942 and might have changed the outcome in the Mediterranean. Germany's other allies, Romania, Hungary and Finland, are all capable of making aircraft, but lack the knowledge and resources that the Fatherland can provide. Had these nations been granted licenses to build Nazi aircraft on their own soil, there was a good chance that this coalition might have tipped the scale in favour of Germany during its pivotal battle against the Soviets during 1941. 
The decision not to fully utilize the resources of these nations can be attributed to Germany's desire to be the dominant power. There is widespread resentment against the Italians by top Nazi leaders who see them as merely riding off the coattails of German success. Our feeling always was with the experience of the First World War already, you know, uh, we wish the Italians were on the other side. People like Hermann Goering see these smaller countries as the providers of natural resources with the fatherland supplying the finished products. This marks another tragic failure of the Luftwaffe. In early 1944, Germany unveils the Messerschmitt 262, a revolutionary jet plane that can hopefully take down the flying fortresses and mosquitoes that are destroying their cities. Later on, of course, they produced the world's first uh, production model, general use jet aircraft in the, in the form of the Messerschmitt 262, the ME 262. The ME 262 as a pure fighter was an amazing sight to see. And in fact, anyone looking at it today is still struck by the modern and sleek lines. Now, the ME-262 was, in my opinion, and I've stated this many times, the most formidable aircraft of World War II. The ME-262 is years ahead of its time, symbolizing the Fatherland's creativity and innovation. In many ways, however, the ME-262 also symbolizes Nazi indecision. Unfortunately, the ME-262 got caught in a very, very arcane and difficult procurement process within Germany, uh, wherein basic designs were put forward by competent engineers. They were then changed by, by upper echelons within the Luftwaffe, and of course they had to pass the Hitler test. And no aircraft passed the Hitler test without being significantly modified. The ME-262 is, is no exception. After Professor Messerschmitt tells Hitler that the aircraft can carry up to a thousand kilograms of bombs, Field Marshal Milch, in a fit of rage, tells the Führer that even the smallest infant can see that the 262 is a fighter, not a bomber. After months of wavering, the plane goes ahead as a fighter bomber, taking the sting out of what could have been a ferocious punch. They may possess this wonder weapon, but have few men that can fly it. This becomes the Luftwaffe's final failure, its pilot's lack of training. During its heyday, Germany's finest were given approximately 250 hours of flight time before being sent out to face their enemy, considerably more than the British. And with the Second World War going exceedingly well during 1940 and 1941, the Luftwaffe arrogantly minimizes its training program, figuring that the war will soon be over. By 1942, as the tide begins turning, German pilots are given less than 200 hours of practice flying, while Allied pilots are given over 300. With the war turning against them, shortcuts are made to churn out every single pilot possible. Despite this augmentation, by 1944 the average training time drops to just under 100 hours. In some cases, just a quarter of what P-51 Mustang and P-47 Thunderbolt pilots were given. With air superiority lost over German soil, it becomes a turkey shoot for American and British aviators as they begin gunning down ME-109s and Focke Wolf 190s with ease. At D-Day, in the final planning, um, the head of uh, Allied Tactical Aviation was asked, well, what are we going to do about the German fighters? He said, there aren't going to be any German fighters over the landing beaches. And he was essentially right, because they'd been wiped out by that. The decision not to build a pilot training infrastructure like its enemies causes the Luftwaffe to run desperately short on experienced men. So by the time planes like the ME-262, the Arado 234 jet bomber, the ME-163, a rocket-powered interceptor, the Dornier 335 Arrow, the fastest piston engine plane of the Second World War, and all the other revolutionary aircraft that could have been the difference maker on both fronts, it is a case of too little too late. The defeat of the Luftwaffe can be attributed to its lack of direction. With the war going in Germany's favor, Hitler, Goering and Udet were blinded by a false optimism. The tactical war doctrine that they favored initially was being replaced by a long, drawn-out strategic war that they were ill-prepared for. The arrogant nature in which they brushed off the industrial power of the United States and the Soviet Union 
the mismanagement of their own country's aircraft industry on a grand scale, and the lack of infrastructure, production and training during the Second World War's most decisive years would cause the Luftwaffe to write its own epitaph. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.